Chapter Four. Why did we stand for it? Among my readers, there is a certain educated Marxist historian, sitting in his soft armchair and leafing through this book to the passage about how we built the disciplinary barracks. He takes off his glasses, taps the page with something flat, a ruler perhaps, and nods his head repeatedly. Yes, yes, this bit I can believe. But all that stuff about the、um, whiff of revolution—I'll be damned if I do. You could not have a revolution because revolutions take place in accordance with the laws of history. In your case, all that had happened was that a few thousand so-called politicals were picked up, and did what? Deprived of human appearance, of dignity, family, freedom, clothing, food. What did you do? Why didn't you revolt? We were earning our rations. I told you, building a prison. That's fine. Just what you should have been doing. It was for the good of the people. It was the only correct solution. But don't call yourself revolutionaries, my friends. To make a revolution, you must be linked with the one and only progressive class. Yes, but weren't we all workers by then? That is neither here nor there. That is a philistine quibble. Have you any idea what historical necessity means? I rather think I have. I honestly have. I have an idea that when camps with millions of prisoners exist for forty years, that's where we can see historical necessity at work. So many millions, for so many years, cannot be explained by Stalin's vagaries or Beria's perfidy, by the naive trustfulness of the ruling party, or of which the light of the vanguard doctrine never ceased to shine. But I won't cast this example of historical necessity in my opponent's teeth. He would only smile sweetly and tell me that was not the subject under discussion; that I was straying from the point. He sees that I am at a loss; that I have no clear conception of historical necessity, and explains: those were revolutionaries who rose up and swept Tsarism away with their broom. Very simple. If Tsar Nicky had so much as tried to squeeze his revolutionaries so hard, if he had just tried to pin numbers on them, if he had even tried, you are right. He didn't try. He didn't try, and that's the only reason why they survived to try it when he had gone. But he couldn't try it. He couldn't. Probably also correct. Not that he might not have liked to, but that he couldn't. In the conventional cadet. Let alone socialist interpretation, the whole of Russian history is a succession of tyrannies: the Tatar tyranny, the tyranny of the Moscow princes, five centuries of indigenous tyranny on the Oriental model, and of a social order firmly and frankly rooted in slavery. Forget about the assemblies of the land, the village commune, the free Cossacks, the free peasantry of the north. Whether it is Ivan the Terrible, Alexis the Gentle. Heavy-handed Peter or Velvety Catherine, all the Tsars right up to the Crimean War knew one thing only: how to crush, to crush their subjects like beetles or caterpillars. If a man was sentenced to hard labor and deportation, they pricked on his body the letters S K and chained him to his wheelbarrow. The state bore hard on its subjects; it was unflinchingly firm. Mutinies and uprisings were invariably crushed. Only. Only crushed, yes, but the word needs qualification. Not crushed in our modern technical sense. After the war with Napoleon, when our army came back from Europe, the first breath of freedom passed over Russian society. Faint as it was, the Tsar had to reckon with it. The common soldiers, for instance, who took part in the Decemberist rising, was a single one of them strung up. Was a single one shot. And in our day, would a single one of them have been left alive? Neither Pushkin nor Lermontov could be simply put inside for a tenor. Roundabout ways of dealing with them had to be found. Where would you have been in Petersburg on December the fourteenth? Nicholas the first asked Pushkin. Pushkin answered honestly, "On the Senate Square." And by way of punishment, he was told to go home. Whereas all of us who have felt on our own hide the workings of a mechanized judicial system, and of course all our friends in public prosecutors' offices, know the proper price for Pushkin's answer: 
Article 58, Section 2, Armed Insurrection, or the mildest possible treatment, Article 19, Criminal Intent, and if not shooting, certainly nothing short of a tenor. Our Pushkins had heavy sentences slapped on them, went to the camps and died. Gumilyev never even got as far as a camp. They settled accounts with him in a cellar. Of all her wars, the Crimea was Russia's luckiest. It brought the emancipation of the peasants and Alexander's reforms, and what is more, the greatest of social forces, public opinion, appeared simultaneously in Russia. On the face of it, the Siberian Katorga went on festering and even spread. More transit prisons were brought into operation, prisoners were still transported in droves, courts were always in session. But what is this? The courts were in session, but Vera Sadzulich, who shot at the chief of police in the capital, was acquitted. Seven attempts were made on the life of Alexander II himself. Karakozovs, Solovyovs, one near Alexandrovsk, one outside Kursk, Kalturin's explosion, Teterka's mine, Grinevitsky. Karakozov, incidentally, had a brother. Brother of the man who tried to shoot the Tsar? Measure that by our yardstick. What was his punishment? He was ordered to change his name to Vladimirov. He suffered neither loss of property rights nor restrictions as to his place of residence. Alexander II went around Petersburg with fear in his eyes, but incidentally without a bodyguard. Like a hunted animal, according to Tolstoy, who met the Tsar on the staircase of a private house. What did he do about it? ruin and banish half Petersburg, as happened after Kirov's murder. You know very well that such a thing could never enter his head. Did he apply the methods of prophylactic mass terror, total terror, as in 1918? Take hostages, the concept didn't exist. Imprison dubious persons, it simply wasn't possible. Execute thousands, they executed five. Fewer than 300 were convicted by the courts in this period. If just one such attempt had been made on Stalin, how many million lives would it have cost us? The Bolshevik Olminsky writes that in 1891 he was the only political prisoner in the whole Kresty prison. Transferred to Moscow, he was the only one in the Taganka. It was only in the Butyrki, awaiting deportation, that a small party of them was assembled. With every year of education and literary freedom, the invisible but terrible power of public opinion grew, until the Tsars lost their grip on both reins and main, and Nicholas II could only clutch at crupper and tail. It is true that the inertial undertow of dynastic tradition prevented him from understanding the demands of his age, and that he lacked the courage to act. In the age of airplanes and electricity, he still lacked all social awareness, and thought of Russia as his own rich and richly variegated estate, in which to levy tribute, breed stallions, and raise armies for a bit of a war now and again with his imperial brother of the House of Hohenzollern. But neither he, nor any of those who governed for him, any longer had the will to fight for their power. They no longer crushed their enemies, they merely squeezed them gently and let them go. They were forever looking over their shoulders and straining their ears. What would public opinion say? They persecuted revolutionaries just sufficiently to broaden their circle of acquaintance in prisons, toughen them, and wring their heads with halos. We now have an accurate yardstick to establish the scale of these phenomena, and we can safely say that the Tsarist government did not persecute revolutionaries, but tenderly nurtured them for its own destruction. The uncertainty, half-heartedness, and feebleness of the Tsarist government are obvious to all who have experienced an infallible judicial system. Let us examine, for instance, some generally known biographical facts about Lenin. In spring 1887, his brother was executed for an attempt on the life of Alexander III. It was incidentally established in the course of investigation that Anna Ulyanova had received a coded telegram from Vilna, Sister dangerously ill, which meant weapons on the way. Anna was not surprised, although she had no sister in Vilna, and for some reason passed it on to Alexander. She was obviously his accomplice, 
and in our day she could have been sure of a tenor. But Anna was not even asked to account for it. In the same case, it was established that another Anna, Serdyukova, a schoolteacher at Jekaterinoda, had direct knowledge of the planned attempt on the Tsar and kept silent. What would have happened to her in our time? She would have been shot. And what did they give her? Two years. Like Karakozov's brother, Lenin was the brother of a would-be regicide. And what happened to him? In the autumn of that very year, Vladimir Ulyanov was admitted to the Imperial University at Kazan, and what is more to the law faculty. Surprising, isn't it? True, Vladimir Ulyanov was expelled from the university in the same academic year, but this was for organizing a student demonstration against the government. The younger brother of a would-be regicide inciting students to insubordination? What would he have got for that in our day? He would certainly have been shot. And of the rest, some would have got twenty-five and others ten years. Whereas he was merely expelled. Such cruelty. Yes, but he was also banished. To Sakhalin? There were, incidentally, political prisoners on Sakhalin, but it happened not a single notable Bolshevik, or for that matter Menshevik, was ever there. No, to the family estate of Kokushkino, where he intended to spend the summer anyway. He wanted to work, so they gave him an opportunity. To fell trees in the frozen north? No, to practice law in Samara, where he was simultaneously active in illegal political circles. After this, he was allowed to take his examinations at St. Petersburg University as an external student. With his curriculum vitae, what was the special section thinking of? Then a few years later, this same young revolutionary was arrested for founding in the capital a league of struggle for the liberation of the working class, no less. He had repeatedly made seditious speeches to workers, had written political leaflets. Was he tortured, starved? No, they created for him conditions conducive to intellectual work. In the Petersburg investigation prison where he was held for a year and where he was allowed to receive the dozens of books he needed, he wrote the greater part of The Development of Capitalism in Russia and, moreover, forwarded legally through the prosecutor's office his economic essays to the Marxist journal Novoye Slovo. While in prison, he followed a prescribed diet, could have dinners sent in at his own expense, buy milk, buy mineral water from a chemist's shop, and receive parcels from home three times a week. Trotsky, too, was able to put the first draft of his theory of permanent revolution on paper in the Peter and Paul fortress. But then, of course, he was condemned by a three-man tribunal and shot. No, he wasn't even jailed, only banished. To Yakutia, then, for life? No, to a land of plenty, Minusinsk, and for three years. He was taken there in handcuffs, in a prison train? Not at all. He travelled like a free man, went around Petersburg for three days without interference, then did the same in Moscow. He had to leave instructions for clandestine correspondence, establish connections, hold a conference of revolutionaries still at large. He was even allowed to go into exile at his own expense that is, to travel with free passengers. Lenin never sampled a single convict train or a single transit prison on his way out to Siberia or, of course, on the return journey. Then, in Krasnoyarsk, two more months' work in the library saw the development of capitalism finished, and this book, written by a political exile, appeared in print without obstruction from the censorship. Measure that by our yardstick. But what would he live on in that remote village where he would obviously find no work? He asked for an allowance from the state, and they paid him more than he needed. It would have been impossible to create better conditions than Lenin enjoyed in his one and only period of banishment. A healthy diet at extremely low prices, plenty of meat, a sheep every week, milk, vegetables. He could hunt to his heart's content. When he was dissatisfied with his dog, friends seriously considered sending him one from Petersburg. When mosquitoes bit him while he was out hunting, he ordered kid gloves. He was cured of his gastric disorders and the other illnesses of his youth, and rapidly put on weight. 
He had no obligations, no work to do, no duties, nor did his women folk exert themselves. For two and a half rubles a month, a fifteen-year-old peasant girl did all the rough work about the house. Lenin had no need to write for money, turned down offers of paid work from Petersburg, and wrote only things which could bring him literary fame. He served his term of banishment. He could have escaped without difficulty, but was too circumspect for that. Was his sentence automatically extended, converted to deportation for life? How could it be? That would have been illegal. He was given permission to reside in Pskov, on condition that he did not visit the capital. He did visit Riga and Smolensk. He was not under surveillance. Then he and his friend Martov took a basket of forbidden literature to the capital, travelling via Tsarskoye Selo, where there were particularly strict controls. They had been too clever by half. He was picked up in Petersburg. True, he no longer had the basket, but he did have a letter to Plekhanov in invisible ink with the whole plan for launching Iskra. The police, though, could not put themselves to all that trouble. He was under arrest and in a cell for three weeks. The letter was in their hands, and it remained undeciphered. What was the result of this unauthorized absence from Pskov? Twenty years hard labor, as it would have been in our time? No, just those three weeks under arrest. After which he was freed completely to travel around Russia, setting up distribution centers for Iskra, then abroad to arrange publication. The police see no objection to granting him a passport for foreign travel. But this was the least of it. As an emigre, he would send home to Russia an article on Marx for the Granat Encyclopedia, and it would be printed. Just imagine the Bolshaya Encyclopedia publishing an emigre article on Berdyayev. Nor was it the only one. Finally, he carried on subversive activity from a little town in Austrian Poland, near the Russian frontier. But no one sent undercover thugs to abduct him and bring him back alive, though it would have been the easiest thing in the world. Tsardom was always weak and irresolute in pursuit of its enemies. You can trace the same pattern in the story of any important social democrat, Stalin in particular. Though here suspicion of other contributory factors insinuates itself. Thus, in 1904, Kamenev's room in Moscow was searched, and compromising correspondence was seized. Under interrogation, he refused all explanation, and that was that. He was banished to his parents' place of residence. The SRs, it is true, were persecuted more severely, but how severely? Would you say that Gershuni, arrested in 1903, had no serious crimes to answer for, or Savinkov? Arrested in 1906, they organized the assassination of some of the highest placed people in the empire. Yet they were not executed. Then Maria Spiridonova was allowed to escape. She shot General Luzhenovsky, who put down the peasant rising in Tambov, shot him point blank, and once again they could not bring themselves to execute a terrorist, and only sent her to forced labor. She was released from forced labor by the February Revolution, but then in 1918 she was arrested on a number of occasions by the Cheka. Like other socialists, she was shuffled, redealt, and finally discarded in the great game of patience. She spent some time in exile in Samarkand, Tashkent, and Upa. Afterward, her trail is lost in one of the political isolators. Somewhere or other, she was shot. Just imagine what would have happened if a seventeen-year-old schoolgirl had shot the suppressor of the 1921 peasant rising, also in Tambov. How many thousands of high school pupils and intellectuals would have been summarily shot without trial in the wave of retaliatory red terror? Were people shot for the naval mutiny at Sveborg? No, just exiled. Ivanov Razumnik recalls how students were punished. For the great demonstration in Petersburg in 1901, the scene in the Petersburg prison was like a student picnic. Roars of laughter, community singing, students walking around freely from cell to cell. Ivanov Razumnik even had the impertinence to ask the prison governor to let him attend a performance by the touring company of the Moscow Art Theatre, so as not to waste his ticket. Later, he was sentenced to banishment to Simferopol, which was his own choice. And he hiked all over the Crimea with a rucksack. 
Ariadna Tirkova writes about this period as follows. We stuck to our principles and the prison regime was not strict. Gendarme officers offered them meals from the best restaurant, Dodon's. According to the indefatigably curious Burtsev, the Petersburg prisons were much more humane than those of Western Europe. For calling on the Moscow workers to rise up in arms and overthrow the autocracy. Leonid Andreev was kept in a cell for fifteen whole days. He himself thought it was rather little and added three weeks in his own account. Here are some entries in his diary at the time. Solitary confinement. Never mind, it's not so bad. I make my bed, pull up my stool and my lamp, put some cigarettes and a pear nearby. I read, eat my pear, just like home. I feel merry. That's the word, merry. Sir, excuse me, sir, the warder calls to him through the feeding hatch. Several books have arrived, and notes from neighboring cells. Summing it up, Andreev acknowledged that as far as board and lodging were concerned, he lived better in his cell than he had as a student. At this very time, Gorky was writing Children of the Sun in the Trubetskoy Bastion. The Bolshevik elite published a pretty shameless piece of self-advertisement in the shape of volume 41 of the Granat Encyclopedia. Prominent personalities of the USSR and the October Revolution, autobiographies and biographies. Read whichever of them you like. You will be astounded to find how lightly, by our standards, they got away with their revolutionary activity. And, in particular, what favorable conditions they enjoyed in prison. Take Krasin, for instance. He always remembered imprisonment in the Taganka with great pleasure. After the initial interrogations, the gendarmes left him in peace. Why? And he devoted his involuntary leisure to unremitting toil. He learned German, read almost all the works of Schiller and Goethe in the original, acquainted himself with Schopenhauer and Kant, thoroughly studied Mill's logic and Bunt's psychology, and so on. For his place of exile, Krasin chose Irkutsk, the capital of Siberia, and its most civilized town. This is Radek, in prison in Warsaw in 1906. He was in for half a year, of which he made splendid use, learning Russian, reading Lenin, Plekhanov, and Marx. While in prison, he wrote his first article on the trade union movement, and was terribly proud when he received, in jail, the issue of Kautsky's journal containing his contribution. At the other extreme, Samashko's imprisonment, Moscow, 1895, was unusually harsh. After three months in jail, he was exiled for three years to his native town, Yelets. The reputation of the terrible Russian Bastille was created in the West by people demoralized by imprisonment, like Parvus, who wrote his highly colored, bombastic, sentimental reminiscences to avenge himself on Tsarism. The same pattern can be traced in the experience of lesser personalities in thousands of individual life stories. I have on hand an encyclopedia, not the most obviously relevant, since it is the literary encyclopedia, and an old edition at that, 1932, complete with errors. Before someone eradicates these errors, I will take the letter K at random. Karpenko Kari, while secretary to the city police in Yeletsevetgrad, provided passports for revolutionaries. Translating as we go into our own language, an official in the passport section supplied an underground organization with passports? Was he hanged for it? No, banished for five years to his own farm. In other words, to his country home. He became a writer. Kirillov, VT, took part in the revolutionary movement of the Black Sea Sailors. Shot? Hard labor for life? No. Three years banishment to Ust-Sisolsk. Became a writer. Kasatkin, I am, while in prison wrote stories which were published in newspapers. In our time, even ex-prisoners cannot get published. Karpov, Yevtiki, after two periods of banishment, was put in charge of the Imperial Alexandrinsky Theater and the Suvorin Theater. In our time, he would never have obtained permission to reside in the capital, and in any case, the special section would not have taken him on as a prompter. 
Przeznowski returned from banishment when the Stolypin reaction was at its wildest and, while remaining a member of the underground Bolshevik Central Committee, took up his profession as an engineer without hindrance. In our time, he would have been lucky to find a job as a mechanic in a machine and tractor station. Although Karlenko hasn't got into the literary encyclopedia, it seems only right to mention him among the K's. In all his years as a revolutionary hothead, he three times successfully avoided arrest. This and what follows is taken from his autobiography in the Granite Encyclopedia. And was six times arrested, but spent in all only 14 months in prison. In 1907, that year of reaction again, he was accused of agitation among the troops and participation in a military organization, and acquitted by the military district court. In 1915, for evading military service, he was an officer and there was a war on, this future commander-in-chief and murderer of his predecessor in that post was punished by being sent to a front line, but not a punitive, unit. This was how the Tsar's government proposed to damp down the fires of revolution while simultaneously defeating the Germans. And for fifteen years it was under the shadow of his unclipped procuratorial wing that the endless lines of those condemned in countless trials shuffled through the courts to receive their bullet in the back of the head. During the Stolypin reaction again, V.A. Starosowski, governor of Kutaisi, who unhesitatingly supplied revolutionaries with passports and arms and betrayed the plans of the police and the government forces to them, got away with something like two weeks' imprisonment. Translate that into our language, if you have imagination enough. During this same reactionary phase, the Bolshevik philosophical and political journal Misl was legally published. And the reactionary, Vekhi, openly wrote about the obsolete autocracy, the evils of despotism and slavery. Fine, keep it up, we don't mind a bit. The severity of those times was beyond human endurance. V. K. Yanovsky, an art photographer in Yalta, made a sketch showing the shooting of the Ochakov sailors and exhibited it in his shop window, much as if someone nowadays had exhibited episodes from the punitive operation at Novocherkask, in a window on Kuznetsky Most. And what did the Yalta police chief do? Because Livadia was so near, he behaved with particular cruelty. He began by shouting at Yanovsky, and he went on to destroy, not Yanovsky's studio, oh dear no, not the sketch of the shooting, but a copy of the sketch. Some will explain this by Yanovsky's sleight of hand, but let us note that the governor did not order the window to be broken in his presence. Thirdly, a very heavy penalty was inflicted on Yonovsky himself. As long as he continued to reside in Yalta, he must not appear in the street while the imperial family was passing through. Burtsev, in an émigré journal, went so far as to cast aspersions on the private life of the Tsar. When he returned to the motherland, on the flood tide of patriotism in 1914, was he shot? He spent less than a year in prison, with permission to receive books and to carry on his literary pursuits. No one stayed the axe man's hand, and in the end the tree would fall. When Tukhachevsky was repressed, as they call it, not only was his immediate family broken up and imprisoned, it hardly needs to be said that his daughter was expelled from her institute, but his two brothers and their wives, his four sisters and their husbands, were all arrested while his nephews and nieces were scattered about various orphanages and their surnames changed to Tomashevich, Rostov, etc. His wife was shot in a camp in Kazakhstan. His mother begged for alms on the streets of Astrakhan and died there. I cite this example in sympathy for his innocent relatives. Tukhachevsky himself is becoming the object of a new cult to which I do not intend to subscribe. Was he reaped he had sown when he directed the suppression of the Kronstadt Rising and of the Peasant Rising in Tambov? Similar stories can be told about the relatives of hundreds of other eminent victims. That is real persecution. The most important special feature of persecution, if you can call it that, in Tsarist times, was perhaps just this, that the revolutionaries' relatives never suffered in the least. Natalia Sedova, 
Trotsky's wife, returned to Russia without hindrance in 1907, when Trotsky was a condemned criminal. Any member of the Ulyanov family, though nearly all of them were arrested at one time or another, could readily obtain permission to go abroad at any moment. When Lenin was on the wanted list for his exhortations to armed uprising, his sister Anna legally and regularly transferred money to his account with the Crédit Lyonnais in Paris. Both Lenin's mother and Krupskaya's mother, as long as they lived, received state pensions for their deceased husbands, one a high-ranking civil servant, the other an army officer, and it would have been unthinkable to make life hard for them. Such were the circumstances in which Tolstoy came to believe that only moral self-improvement was necessary, not political freedom. Of course, no one is in need of freedom if he already has it. We can agree with him that political freedom is not what matters in the end. The goal of human evolution is not freedom for the sake of freedom, nor is it the building of an ideal polity. What matter, of course, are the moral foundations of society. But that is in the long run. What about the beginning? What about the first step? Yasnaya Polyana in those days was an open club for thinkers. But if it had been blockaded, as Akhmatova's apartment was when every visitor was asked for his passport, if Tolstoy had been pressed as hard as we all were in Stalin's time, when three men feared to come together under one roof, even he would have demanded political freedom. At the most dreadful moment of the Stolopin terror, the liberal newspaper Rus was allowed to report in bold type on its front page, five executions, twenty executed at Kherson. Tolstoy broke down and wept, said that he couldn't go on living, that it was impossible to imagine anything more horrible. Then there is the previously mentioned list in Bailoy, 950 executions in six months. Let us take this issue of Bailoy. Note that it appeared well within the eight-month period of Stolypin's Military Justice, August 1906 to April 1907, and that the list was compiled from data published by Russian news agencies, much as though the Moscow papers in 1937 had given lists of those shot, which were then collated and republished, with the NKVD tamely turning a blind eye. Secondly, this eight-month period of martial justice which had no precedent and was not repeated in Tsarist Russia, could not be prolonged because the impotent and docile State Duma would not ratify such measures. Indeed, Stolypin did not venture to submit them to the Duma for discussion. Thirdly, the events during the previous six months invoked in justification of military law included the murder of innumerable police officers for political motives, many attacks on officials, and the explosion on Aptekarsky Island. If, it was argued, the state does not put a stop to these terrorist acts, then it will forfeit its right to exist. So Stolopin's ministry, impatient and angry with the jury courts and their leisurely inconsequences, their powerful and uninhibited bar, not a bit like our oblast courts or district tribunals, obedient to a telephone call, snatched at a chance to curb the revolutionaries, and also straightforward bandits, who shot at the windows of passenger trains and killed ordinary citizens for a few rubles, by means of the laconic court-martial. Even so, there were restrictions. A court-martial could be set up only in places in which martial law or a state of emergency had been declared. It convened only when the evidence of crime was fresh, not more than twenty-four hours after the event, and when a crime had manifestly been committed. If contemporaries were stunned and shocked, it was obviously because this was something new to Russia. In the 1906 to 1907 situation, we see that the revolutionaries must take their share of the blame for the Stolypin terror, as well as the government. A hundred years after the birth of revolutionary terror, we can say without hesitation that the terrorist idea and terrorist actions were a hideous mistake on the part of the revolutionaries and a disaster for Russia, bringing her nothing but confusion, grief, and inordinate human losses. Let us turn over a few more pages in the same number of Bolyoy. Here is one of the earliest proclamations, dating from 1862, which were the start of it all. What is it that we want? The good, the happiness of Russia. Achieving a new life, a better life, without casualties, is impossible, because we cannot afford delay. 
We need speedy, immediate reform. What a false path! They, the zealots, could not afford to wait, and so they sanctioned human sacrifice of others, not themselves, to bring universal happiness nearer. They could not afford to wait, and so we, their great grandsons, are not at the same point as they were when the peasants were freed, but much farther behind. Let us admit that the terrorists were worthy partners of Stolypin's courts martial. What for us makes comparison between the Stolypin and the Stalin periods impossible is that in our time the barbarity was all on one side. Heads were cut off for a sigh or for less than a sigh. I state with confidence that our age has also surpassed that of the Tsars in the scale and technical level of its summary punitive operations. Suppression of peasant revolt in 1918 to 1919, Tambov Rising 1921, Kuban and Kazakhstan 1930. Nothing more horrible," exclaimed Tolstoy. "It is, however, very easy to imagine things more horrible. It is more horrible when executions take place, not from time to time, and in one particular city of which everybody knows, but everywhere and every day, and not twenty, but two hundred at a time, with the newspapers saying nothing about it in print, big or small, but saying instead that life has become better, life has become more cheerful." They bash your face in and say it was always ugly. No, things weren't the same, not at all the same. Although the Russian state even then was considered the most oppressive in Europe, the twenties and thirties of our century have deepened man's understanding of the possible degrees of compression, the terrestrial dust, the earth, which seemed to our ancestors as compact as may be, is now seen by physicists as a sieve full of holes. An isolated speck in a hundred meters of emptiness—that is a model of the atom. They have discovered the nightmarish possibility of atom packing, forcing all the tiny nuclear specks from all those hundred meter vacuums together. A thimbleful of such packing weighs as much as a normal locomotive. But even this packing is too much like fluff. The protons prevent you from compressing the nuclei as tight as you could wish. If you could compress neutrons alone. A postage stamp made of such neutron packing would weigh five million tons, and that is how tightly they squeezed us without any help from pioneering physicists. Through Stalin's lips, our country was bidden henceforth to renounce complacency, but under the word used for complacency, Dahl gives kindness of heart, a loving state of mind, charity. A concern for the general good—that was what we were called upon to renounce, and we did so in a hurry. Renounced all concern for the general good. Henceforth, our own feeding trough was enough for us. Russian public opinion, by the beginning of the century, constituted a marvelous force, was creating a climate of freedom. The defeat of Tsarism came not when Kolchak was routed, not when the February Revolution was raging, but much earlier. It was overthrown without hope of restoration once Russian literature adopted the convention that anyone who depicted a gendarme or policeman with any hint of sympathy was a lickspittle and a reactionary thug. When you didn't have to shake a policeman's hand, cultivate his acquaintance, nod to him in the street, but merely brush sleeves with him in passing to consider yourself disgraced. Whereas we have butchers who. Because they are now redundant, and because their qualifications are right, are in charge of literature and culture. They order us to extol them as legendary heroes, and to do so is for some reason called patriotism. Public opinion—I don't know how sociologists define it, but it seems obvious to me that it can only consist of interacting individual opinions, freely expressed and independent of government or party opinion. So long as there is no independent public opinion in our country, there is no guarantee that the extermination of millions and millions for no good reason will not happen again. That it will not begin any night, perhaps this very night. The vanguard doctrine, as we have seen, gave us no protection against this plague. But I can see my opponent pulling faces, winking at me, wagging his head. In the first place, the enemy may overhear me, and secondly. Why such a broad treatment of the subject? The question was posed much more narrowly. 
It was not why we were jailed, nor why did those who remained free tolerate this lawlessness. Everyone knows that they didn't realize what was going on, that they simply believed the party, that if whole peoples are banished in the space of 24 hours, those peoples must be guilty. The question is a different one. Why did we in the camps, where we did realize what was going on, suffer hunger, bend our backs, put up with it all, instead of fighting back? The others, who had never marched under escort, who had the free use of their arms and legs, could be forgiven for not fighting. They couldn't, after all, sacrifice their families, their positions, their wages, their authors' fees. They're making up for it now by publishing critical reflections in which they reproach us for clinging to our rations instead of fighting, when we had nothing to lose. But I have all along been leading up to my answer to this question. The reason why we put up with it all in the camps is that there was no public opinion outside. What conceivable ways has the prisoner of resisting the regime to which he is subjected? Obviously they are, one, protest, two, hunger strike, three, escape, four, mutiny. So then it is obvious to anybody, as the great deceased liked to say, and if it isn't, we'll ram it into him, that if the first two have some force, and if the jailers fear them, it is only because of public opinion. Without that behind us, we can protest and fast as much as we like, and they will laugh in our faces. It is a very dramatic way of obtaining your demands, standing before the prison authorities and tearing open your shirt, as Zerzhinsky did. But only where public opinion exists, without it you'll be gagged with the tatters and pay for a government-issue shirt into the bargain. Let me remind you of a celebrated event which took place in the Kara Hard Labour Prison at the end of the last century. Political prisoners were informed that in future they would be liable to corporal punishment. Nadezhda Sigida was due to be thrashed first. She had slapped the commandant's face to force him to resign. She took poison and died rather than submit to the birch. Three other women then poisoned themselves and also died. In the men's barracks, fourteen prisoners volunteered to commit suicide, though not all of them succeeded. We may note here some significant details from Ian Kovalskaya, Zhenska Katorga, women political prisoners, Goizizdat, 1920, pages 8 to 9, and G.F. Osmolovsky, Karyskaya Tragedia, The Tragedy at Kara, Moscow, 1920. Sigida struck and spat on an officer for absolutely no reason, because of the neurotic atmosphere among political prisoners. After this, the gendarme officer, Mazyukov, asked a political prisoner, Osmolovsky, to interrogate him. The governor of the prison, Bobrovsky, died repentant and would not even accept consolation from the priest. If only we had jailers with consciences like these. Sigida was beaten with her clothes on, and Kovalskaya's dress was changed by other women, and not, as rumor had it, in the presence of men. As a result, corporal punishment was abolished outright and forever. The prisoners had counted on frightening the prison authorities, for news of the tragedy at Kara would reach Russia and the whole world. But if we measure this case against our own experience, we shall shed only tears of scorn, smack the commandant's face for an injury inflicted on someone else. And what is so terrible about a few thwacks across the backside? You'll go on living? And why did her women friends take poison too? And why fourteen men besides? We're only given one life, we must make the best of it. As long as we get food and drink, why part with life? Besides, maybe there will be an amnesty. Maybe they'll start giving us good conduct marks. You see, from what a lofty plane prison behavior has declined, and how low we have fallen, and how, by the same token, our jailers have risen in the world. No, these are not the bumpkins of Kara. Even if we had plucked up our courage and risen above ourselves, four women and fourteen men, we should all have been shot before we got at any poison. Where, in any case, would it come from in a Soviet prison? If you did manage to poison yourself, you would only make the task of the authorities easier and the rest would be treated to a dose of the birch for not denouncing you. And, needless to say, no word of the occurrence would ever leak through the boundary wires. This is the point, 
This is where their power lies. No news could leak out. If some muffled rumour did, with no confirmation from newspapers, with informers busily nosing it out, it would not get far enough to matter. There would be no outburst of public indignation. So what is there to fear? So why should they lend an ear to our protests? If you want to poison yourselves, get on with it. The hopelessness of our hunger strikes has been sufficiently shown in Part 1. Escape, then. History has preserved for us accounts of some major escapes from Tsarist prisons. All of them, let us note, were engineered and directed from outside by other revolutionaries, party comrades of the escapers, with incidental help from many sympathizers. Many people were involved in the escape itself, in concealing the escapers afterward, and in slipping them across the frontier. Aha! My Marxist historian has caught me out here. That was because the population sided with the revolutionaries, and because the future belonged to them. Perhaps also, I humbly reply, because it was all a jolly game and a legal one, fluttering your handkerchief from a window, letting a runaway share your bedroom, helping him with his disguise. These were not indictable offences. When Pyotr Lavrov ran away from his place of banishment, the governor of Bologda, Kominsky, gave his civil law wife permission to leave and catch up with her man. Even for forging passports, you could just be rusticated to your own farm, as we saw. People were not afraid. Do you know from your own experience what that means? While I think of it, how is it that you were never inside? Well, you know, it was all a lottery. There is, however, evidence of another kind. We were all made to read Gorky's Mother at school, and some of you may remember the account of conditions in the Nizhny Novgorod jail. The warders had rusty pistols with which they would knock nails into the walls, and there was no difficulty at all in placing a ladder against the prison wall and calmly discharging yourself. The high police official Ratayev writes as follows. Banishment existed only on paper. Prison didn't exist at all. Prison conditions at that time were such that a revolutionary who landed in prison could continue his former activities without hindrance. The Kiev Revolutionary Committee were all in jail together, and while there, directed a strike in the city and issued appeals. Letter from L.A. Ratayev to P.N. Zuyev in Baloy. Ratayev goes on to speak of the general situation in Russia outside. Secret agents and freelance detectives didn't exist anywhere, except in the two capitals. A.S. Surveillance was carried out if absolutely necessary by non-commissioned gendarme officers in disguise who sometimes forgot to remove their spurs when they put on civilian clothes. In these circumstances, a revolutionary only had to transfer his activities outside the capitals and they would remain an impenetrable secret for the Department of Police. In this way, real nests of revolution and hotbeds of propaganda and agitation were created. Our readers will readily grasp the difference between this and the Soviet period. Igor Sadzanov, waiting his chance to kill Minister Pleve, disguised himself as a cabby and with a bomb hidden in his droshki, stood outside the main entrance of the police department for a whole day, and no one took any notice of him or asked him what he was doing. Kalyev, still inexperienced, spent a whole day on tenterhooks near Pleve's house on the Fontanka, fully expecting to be arrested, and no one touched him. Golden days. In such conditions, revolution was easy. I have at present no access to information about security at the principal locations of the Tsarist Katorga, but if escape from them was ever as desperately difficult as it was from their Soviet counterparts, with one chance in 100,000 of success, I have never heard it. There was obviously no reason for prisoners to take great risks. They were not threatened with premature death from exhaustion by hard labor, nor with extensions of sentence, which they had done nothing to deserve. The second half of their term they served not in prison, but in places of banishment, and they usually put off escapes till then. Laziness would seem to be the only reason for not escaping from Tsarist places of banishment. Evidently, exiles reported to the police infrequently, surveillance was poor, there were no secret police posts along the roads, you were not tied to your work day in and day out by police supervision, you had money, or it could be sent to you, and places of banishment were not remote from the great rivers and roads. 
Again, no threat hung over anyone who helped to run away, nor indeed was the runaway himself in danger of being shot by his pursuer, or savagely beaten, or sentenced to twenty-five years' hard labour, as in our day. A recaptured prisoner was usually reinstalled in his previous place to complete his previous sentence, and that was all. You couldn't lose. Vastenko's departure abroad, part one, chapter five, is typical of such ventures. But perhaps the anarchist A.P. Ulanovsky's escape from the Turokan region is even more so. In the course of his escape, it was enough for him to look in at a student reading room and ask for Mikhailovsky's What is Progress? And the students gave him a meal, a bed, and his fare. He escaped abroad by simply walking up the gangway of a foreign ship, no MVD patrol there, of course, and finding a warm spot in the stokehold. More wonderful yet, during the 1914 war, he voluntarily returned to Russia and to his place of banishment in Turukan. Obviously a foreign spy. Shoot him. Come on, you reptile. Tell us whose pay you're in. Well, no. For three years' absence abroad, the magistrate ordered him to pay a fine of three rubles or spend one day in the cells. Three rubles was a lot of money, and Ulanovsky preferred one day in detention. Beginning with attempts to escape from Solovki by sea in some flimsy little boat or in a hold among the timber, and ending with the insane, hopeless, suicidal breakouts from the camps in the late Stalin period, some later chapters are devoted to them, Escape in our time has always been an enterprise for giants among men, but for doomed giants. Such daring, such ingenuity, such willpower never went into pre-revolutionary escape attempts, yet they were very often successful, and ours hardly ever. Because your attempts to escape were essentially reactionary in their class character, can a man's urge to stop being a slave and an animal ever be reactionary? The reason for their failure was that success depends in the later stages of the attempt on the attitude of the population, and our population was afraid to help escapers, or even betrayed them, for mercenary or ideological reasons. So much for public opinion. As for prison mutinies, involving as many as three, five, or eight thousand men, the history of our three revolutions knew nothing of them. Yet we did, but the same curse was upon them and very great efforts, very great sacrifices, produced the most trivial results. Because society was not ready, because without a response from public opinion, a mutiny even in a huge camp has no scope for development. So that when we are asked, why did you put up with it, it is time to answer, but we didn't. Read on, and you will see that we didn't put up with it at all. In the special camps, we raised the banner of the politicals, and politicals we became. 